Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Steve Wilson from the Illinois State Water Survey, and today our webinar is entitled Well Care 101, What You Need to Know to Protect Your Family. And uh, it's hosted uh, by the Illinois State Water Survey at the U of I, uh, along with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, who's our partner in the Private Well Class Program. And uh, all of this work is um, sponded, uh, sponsored, funded, and supported by uh, both RCAP and US EPA, um, who, which is where the original funding comes from. Uh, for this program. Um, if you are a um, sanitarian or um, environmental health professional, NEHA gives credit for these uh, courses, as does Illinois um, LE LEHP program. And at least for NEHA, the way this works is um, we deliver this webinar between either two or three times a year uh, for well owners uh, that are new to our program. And so um, if you've taken the same webinar that the dates are listed here in the bottom right um, and you're under the same cycle for your uh, credentialing at NEHA, you can't get credit for this more than once. And so I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. And uh, the way NEHA works is they have a two-year cycle. And so if it turned out that you're at the end of your two-year cycle for your accreditation and it ends at the end of this month, um, you could take this same uh, webinar the next time we offer it and get credit again for it, but um, not for two more years after that. So this information here, the certificate of attendance, the slide deck, completed NEHA forms are all available. And um, if you look on your GoToWebinar um, menu, there's a thing that says handouts and it says three of five, you can download that stuff there. And if you have any questions, you can always email us at info at privatewellclass.org and, and we can help you out there. So today's webinar is in support of our program, uh, the Private Well Class, and RCAP's program at the U of I. Um, hang on, okay. So these materials follow the course, but um, I do want to mention this is not our Private Well Class. The class is an emailed PDF, uh, 10 lessons that's sent to you, and this webinar is meant to be an opportunity to provide a little more information uh, in support of our class and also to give you an opportunity to ask questions that we uh, plan to answer um, as many of those as we can today uh, from those you submitted and also any that might come up today we'll do at the very end. So um, yeah if, if uh, we get a lot of emails that say hey I'm going to miss the class what do I do um, you know this webinar I just want to make sure everyone's clear is not our class. We do have an online class uh, you sign up with your email address and I'll go over that near the end and it sends you the lesson as a PDF that you're at self-paced, you're on your own to take it, but it provides much more detail than we can do in this hour and a half, and it uh, gives you a good reference set of materials um, for uh, being a good steward of your well and understanding uh, what your well issues are. So I do want to mention RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, uh, who are our partner on this. They actually fund the work we do. Um, they're an association of six um, nonprofits that are regional, um, together they make up the RCAP network and uh, they have staff in every state. Um, part of this program, we're doing the online portion of uh, this private well program that EPA funds. RCAP is implementing the boots on the ground portion. So they have staff in every state who can help you. They put on workshops for both uh, professionals like sanitarians as well as for well owners. Um, we've developed an assessment tool that RCAP staff are going out and using one-on-one -on -one with well owners. And uh, I'll try to remember to talk about that more, but if you're interested in having an RCAP staff person um, talk to you about your well, um, you just need to email us and let us know and we can get them, depending on which region you're in, um, we can get them your information and have them follow up with you. Uh, so today we're really going to talk about well care and the basics of well care. So this is, you know, it's a high level view of, you know, some of the things you need to be aware of. Uh, and I'm Steve Wilson, as I mentioned, I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey. Uh, Katie Buckley is here today. She's our outreach specialist for the private well program. And in your um, GoToWebinar menu bar, there's either a question or a chat um, section. And if you have any questions that come up today um, that you'd like answered at the end, um, put them in either that question or chat box. Katie's going to monitor that and uh, we're making a list as we go, and at the end, uh, at the very end, we'll pull those questions up and try to answer as many of those as we can as well. And um, then also Dan Webb is here. Um, he runs our public service lab. He's a chemist. He's also a private well owner, 
And um, when we get to uh, the questions that you submitted in advance, many of those are about either treatment or water quality that uh, Dan is uh, our guy to answer those things. So, um, yeah, I just want to let you know who's on and who you can contact. And, um, and we have a team that, that really works out well. So a little bit about the water survey. Most people, even in the state of Illinois, aren't familiar with the state water survey because we're the only one in the country. But every state has a state geological survey, and the water survey is a sister agency. We're both under the same department at the U of I, University of Illinois. And this placard is outside our chemistry building on campus. The water survey started in the 1890s because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks in the state. And um, our job initially was to document those, take samples, try to figure out what was going on, and um, the sample data we have, which now we have over 100 years of data, we have over 30,000 water quality samples of wells in Illinois, um, and we also house the state's well logs. So we have over 500,000 well logs that allow us to understand the geology of the state, um, the hydrology, we do groundwater modeling, as well as a lot of water, water quality work. So um, the water survey has been around a long time. And um, we do mostly applied research and public service type efforts. And we support many of the other state agencies. Uh, when they have uh, questions like from private well owners, they send them to us uh, in Illinois. And just as an example, um, we're going through a lot of our historical records. Uh, and some of the community files have information going back, you know, before this is from 1916. Um, but this is a case that the water survey worked on. Uh, there was a typhoid outbreak in Pena, Illinois in 1916. Um, we figured out where all that was, mapped it all, and then eventually they tied it to the ice cream company, the Pena ice cream company that has the arrows there uh, as the cause of that at the time. And there's a lot of neat information that goes along with this map. Um, I really show this for effect. Um, but we've been in the game, if you will, a long time trying to help both well owners and communities um, with their water quality issues. So, as a private well owner, um, some things to remember. And uh, for background, I grew up on a small farm in central Illinois on a 14-foot deep, 3-foot diameter hand-dug well that my grandpa um, dug in 1933. It's uncemented brick. Um, it's in a ravine. So when we had a big rainstorm, we had cloudy water for several days. If I, uh, during the summer, I left the hose in the horse tank too long, um, we might be without water for several days. So, um, you know, that's kind of the worst of the worst type of well to be on, um, which is the way I grew up, um, but we made it work. And so the thing to remember now, I live on, um, I live in a, in a community, a Savoy, Illinois, which is on Champaign City water. And so now I pay $40, $50 a month for my water. And that's what it costs spread out over all the residents here to ensure that there's pipes in the ground that come to my house, all the infrastructure's in place. Someone who understands how to um, sample and ensure that the treatment for the water we drink is correct, um, all those things. But as a private well owner, you're the one person uh, line of defense, if you will, to make sure that you have electricity and power and your pipes aren't, don't corrode and that you've tested so that you know that your water quality is good. Because even a well that's properly installed can have issues, as we'll talk about today. You know, there are naturally occurring contaminants in some cases. Uh, things can happen to a well over time um, that, you know, allow surface contaminants to get in if it's not maintained. So, um, and a lot of people tell me, you know, my water is the best tasting water. There's nothing in it. You can't see a thing. Um, you know, contaminants can be colorless, odorless, and tasteless. So um, that doesn't mean your water's safe. Um, so, yeah, my dad always swore we had the best tasting water because it didn't have chemicals in it that cities put in their water which um, I can tell you uh, is just the opposite of what the case really was. So as far as well considerations, you know, all things being equal, a deeper well, um, I say here, is generally better. And that's from the standpoint of where your water is coming in the well. If you have a sand and gravel well that's only 20 feet deep, you're much more susceptible to surface contamination than if you have a sand and gravel well that's 200 feet deep. And the well screen is at 196 to 200. Because in that situation, that means that sand is, water is only coming in at that uh, deep, uh, that depth. And so um, it's typically better. It's not always the case, but in general, it's, it's better to have a deeper well. Um, and we'll go over those issues in a minute. Um, also, location in the landscape. 
Um, the best example is, if, especially for shallow wells, if you're on a rural subdivision that's near a lake or a river, and the subdivision slopes towards the river, the person who's on the very top end of that, um, generally the water table follows land surface. So the water table is heading towards the, the river or the lake, and anything that gets in the ground between uh, you and, and the river, it's going to pick it up and bring it towards your property. So in that case, shallow wells might be more susceptible. You want to be on a high point in the landscape if you can, or at least your well should be. And again, uh, in those situations, if you have a, you need to understand if your well is fairly shallow, that you need to be more concerned about, um, you know, the direction of groundwater flow, like the example I just gave, and the things around your well. You know, you don't want to store things near your well or upgrading of your well. Um, and it's just being aware is, is half the battle. So uh, first thing I want to talk about is poor construction. There's really two things that, um, well, uh, this is really probably the most important thing uh, as far as the many cases of wells we see that have uh, bacteria contamination or nitrate or other things that are surface um, related. And that's that well construction codes have only been around uh, since the 60s. Uh, in some states, not until the 2000s. In Pennsylvania, they still don't have a construction code that requires a well to be drilled a certain way and the, uh, the to be sealed a specific way, to have grout, all those things. So if you have an older well, like the one I grew up on is still in use today, they are grandfathered in. They don't have to meet the well code that Illinois has today. Um, we also see a lot of wells in pits. Um, before the invention of the pitless adapter, uh, wells were put in pits in cold climates so that the pipes didn't freeze. Um, nowadays, you can use a pitless and run your, uh, your well casing up to the surface and it's just the electricity and, and those things that come up there. Um, and also, again, these old hand dug wells are still in use. And so those are the most susceptible because they typically aren't protective at the surface. And uh, not only are they not protective uh, for a water quality perspective, but they're also a safety hazard. And uh, we're gonna go through some of that. So here's some examples. Um, the, the upper, the picture on the upper right, or upper left, excuse me, came from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They're the agency in Washington State that regulates drillers and construction code. They have a blog, um, and this is uh, one of the pictures in, from one of their blogs a few years ago, where uh, this old well that's you know got a, a steel uh, tile uh, casing had a piece of plywood over it. Um, you know that concrete block was supposed to cover that little hole there, that one foot square, and you can see uh, the. The plywood broke, the woman fell in, and it killed her. Um, but if you look around, there's uh, in the upper left corner of that picture, you know, there's a broom and a mop, and, and the gray stuff looks like insulation. So this is in a little building somewhere. There's a funnel there. Um, you know, none of this is protective. Uh, there's probably mice in here. That stuff's getting in the well. Um, it's just not a very safe supply. The picture up on the upper left, um, is a, an old well that was in southern Illinois. Don Kelderman was uh, actually down there looking for a family plot for his uh, studying his family genealogy and came across this well and there was a dead goat in it. And so, uh, you know, if you're not protecting your well, um, you know, it's not sealed properly, um, all these things can happen. And the picture on the bottom is a well we sampled for a dug and board well study. Um, you can see this, uh, the mud around the side of it and how worn those posts look. That's because that's in a pasture. Those are That's where cattle have been rubbing on um, those posts to scratch. Um, it's just, a, uh, I think it's a six or eight foot diameter uh, cement brick lined well that's got two by tens and then some pieces of tin uh, covered by concrete blocks. You know, snakes, uh, any kind of bugs, everything else can get in there. Plus it's on a slope. That little field on the upslope of it is a cornfield. And so uh, to expect this well not to be contaminated um, um, is just, you know. And what happens is if you've drank this water your whole life, like I drank the water in our well your, my whole life growing up, your body gets used to it. It may not affect you. But um, what happened to me when I left home to go to college and start drinking uh, chlorinated water from the city of Champaign way back in the 80s, um, once I went back home, I couldn't drink our well water anymore. It made me sick. And so it, it can be in some cases what you're used to, and you may think it's fine, but somebody else drinks that water, and it may really make them sick. 
So it's, it's just, it's not protective is the bottom line. So what should you do with these wells? You need to bring them up to code if you can. Um, at least uh, ensure that they're sealed at the top so that there's no pathway into the well. And uh, if it's a, a well in a pit, extend the pipe up uh, to above land surface, fill that pit in with, uh, with grout. Um, a, a well pit, um, again, can be a safety hazard. We see where a tractor is driven over a, a lid to a well pit and it's, you know, caved in the entire thing. If you have a, a big rainstorm and no way to drain that, it may fill up with water overtopping uh, your well cap. And unless it's completely sealed uh, watertight, which is very rare, um, you're going to get surface water going into your well in that case. So, um, you know, talk to your, your well authority or your county health department, ask them, you know, what they recommend and uh, find if you can, there's a way, uh, try to make your well protective of those issues. Um, that also goes along with abandoned wells. So um, many, many times, especially folks who live in the country, um, like I did, they have an old well and then they put in a new well, but they keep the old one maybe for a while, they're irrigating a garden or it's for livestock or whatever, and now they don't have those things and they just keep the well around. Just like well pits, they're a safety hazard. Um, we see all the time where folks um, fall into old abandoned wells and it either hurts them or kills them. Um, it can be dangerous for livestock and it's also a source of contamination for a shallow aquifer. So if you have an abandoned well, the thing to realize is that if anybody's on your property and they fall in uh, an abandoned well, it's likely to leave you responsible. And uh, so it needs to be protected and it really should be filled in uh, properly. So um, yeah, and you can find information on that. I know in some states, uh, so water conservation districts have a cost share program where they might pay for half of the cost of abandoning a well, and you need to talk to uh, the folks in your district about that um, to see if that's uh, an option in your state. Here's just some examples. Again, the two pictures came from the state of Washington's blog, Department of Ecology blog. In one case, there's a, there's a horse that fell in an old abandoned well uh, that wasn't sealed. And in the other one here, uh, the Sheldon man, it says, uh, he was lucky they uh, were able to pull him out and he wasn't hurt. Um, but that doesn't happen all the time. These pictures or these newspaper clippings on the right, uh, three of those are from Illinois. The third one is actually Jessica McClure, the little girl who fell in a well in Texas. And um, if you're old enough to remember, that was covered live on CNN over about 20 hours and um, you know, uh, made national news. Uh, so it was a really interesting. They kept a, they they showed the whole thing live, and then uh, the three newspaper clippings here. You know, back in the '90s, this is in '97. All three of these are. Um, we didn't have the internet per se, and and all in Facebook and some of those things to tell everybody what was going on everywhere in the country. And so the people in Springfield, I will guarantee you, didn't know about the person in Galesburg or the person in Buffalo Grove. And so it just happens a lot more than you realize. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's there's no reason for it. Uh, if you have an old well that you're not using, it should be sealed because it's just a risk. So as far as basic well care, um, you know, the first thing I'll say is, um, you know, there are people that have the wherewithal to manage and take care of their well, um, but they're few and far between. In most cases, you're going to want to use a licensed driller, pump installer, or contractor when doing these things, just to make sure it's properly sealed when you're done, that things have been done according to code, and um, yeah, and that it, your, your well is your drinking water supply, so your family's safe. You don't have to worry about those things. Um, we do see uh, in some states, even in Illinois, as a homeowner, a landowner, you can install your own well. But unless you really have the wherewithal to do that, um, I certainly wouldn't recommend it. So um, yeah, it's just, it, it just isn't worth the risk that you're taking um, if you really don't know what you're doing. So there's a videos online about doing that stuff, and, and I understand some of those things. They're, they're pretty helpful, but um, every single well is different, and what you encounter, the geology you encounter is different, and what might work for one person who's shown a video from uh, Montana or some other uh, state may not work where you're at. Completely different geology, different situation. Um, you need to know what you're getting into. Um, most states have guidebooks and also have rules uh, requiring drillers to be licensed and to follow specific code. And uh, if you're going to install a new well, um, 
I would get familiar with those things first. And that way, when you're talking to prospective drillers, um, you make sure that they understand uh, that you're aware that you've done your homework and um, that you expect these to be done in a certain way. Most states have well logs that are available online, um, or you can get well logs uh, from a state or county uh, agency. You know, if it's worth it to look at what your neighbors have if you're going to drill a new well, just so that you're aware, you know, 75 out of the 100 wells in my township are in a sand and gravel aquifer and the others are dug and bore or are bored wells where there's no sand and gravel. Um, it's good to know where those are at, what you're expecting, um, and those sorts of things. Um, it's also to ensure that when you install your well, it's done properly and, you know, all the rules are being followed. So um, what can you do as far as your well? This is a great example of a well. Um, you know, there's nothing near it. It uh, looks like it's fairly level ground. If you can have it so that the ground slopes up around the well so water will pond away from it, that's even better. But if it has a screen, um, an event with a screen, make sure the screen's in place so that spiders and other bugs aren't getting in your well and building nests, and, you know, that'll lead to bacteria problems, or it can. Um, it should be, uh, and there's even state code for this, 12 to 18 inches above land surface. We see a lot of wells that are right down at the ground. Um, if there's any kind of big rain event, uh, that could be a problem. Um, and also, one thing that a lot of people never do is um, that green casing, or that green cap has, where the bolts fit, has a gasket. And that's what makes it watertight. Those gaskets, especially in a cold climate, um, over several winters, they become brittle, they break. Um, when you take the cap off, uh, that you can see that that gasket no longer is really um, airtight, if you will, or watertight, and it should be replaced uh, to make sure that those things are there. Um, the annulus, if you're not familiar, uh, when you drill a well, um, you may, if you're going to put in, like this looks to be maybe a 5 or a 6-inch uh, PVC casing, so you drill a well that's maybe six and a half to seven and a half or maybe eight inches in diameter. You drill a hole and you put the well in it and the area between the outside of the casing and uh, the edge of the borehole is called the annulus. And um, most state rules say that has to be filled with a grout, which is basically cement or, or, or clay so that it prevents water from running down the annulus and getting in your well um, below the below land surface. So you should look make sure that that's solid and sealed and that there are no gaps and um, you know to make sure yeah there's no way for water to run in along the edge of your well because that's a that's a shortcut a shortcut to get down to where your well screen is if it has a screen or where the casing ends if it's a bedrock well um, this is from Minnesota Department of Health their well owner handbook they have uh, and these are their rules and I show Minnesota's because this is pretty comprehensive Every state has its own rules and different setbacks, but the idea behind this, uh, the reason I'm showing you today, is so that you understand there are a lot of things that can affect your well water quality, and that's why they have rules, just to be safe, keep things away. You shouldn't plant a tree next to it because it looks nice. Trees can really cause a problem down the road as they grow. Um, you can't just stick it anywhere next to a building or somewhere out of the way. Um, you want to have access and it can't be near any of these things. And so these are the setback distances that are listed on the lines, like the 35 for a lake stream or pond, and that's a minimum. Um, many times you'll run into cases where that isn't enough or where to be safe or, you know, especially in certain types of geology like karst geology, you don't want to be any near, anywhere near some of these things because there's uh, pathways through the rock that will allow uh, things to move a lot faster and, and you really want to keep your well in the safest place you can. So the bottom half of this just shows some more um, things, even, you know, three feet from a building, away from an electric line, some things that just seem like common sense, um, but you also need to think about, especially if your pump is in your well, you need to be able to access that. So um, we see wells that are in basements or um, I ran into a case where a person didn't have a lot of room, so they cut their well off below grade and um, then put a concrete pad over it so they could put a garage. Um, not understanding that their pump is down in that well, and uh, now the first time their pump has a problem or they need to do anything, um, they're either going to have to do something to their garage or they're going to have to put in a new well. 
So, you know, common sense comes into play a lot um, with this, and it's just you got to think about things before you make decisions. Um, a little bit about septic systems. Excuse me. Um, so um, many of you probably aren't aware, but um, every year there's a uh, sep uh, there's a, a septic uh, smart week, I guess it's called. Um, and so that's this week. And US EPA has a program called Septic Smart. Um, I'm going to show some of their resources in a minute. But um, septic systems uh, tend to be one of the reasons, one of the big reasons, really there's two, for coliform bacteria contamination or E. coli contamination. It's usually either livestock or your septic system. And a lot of these were put in a long time ago. Uh, some people don't uh, follow best practices related to their septic systems. Either they don't realize they should. Um, or, you know, there's a cost involved. But um, the way your septic system works is everything comes from your house. So if we're looking on the left, that pipe coming in uh, puts everything in your septic tank. And this is a, a two-compartment uh, tank. Most of the solids drop to the bottom. Some things that are less dense may float on top. But that tank keeps those things uh, in place. That lets the water filter through, and there's bacteria in there that start breaking that material down. Um, eventually, as your tank gets full, it starts running. Uh, th that liquid then will run out to, on the right side uh, to a uh, gravel bed. Um, so absorption field, it says here, um, usually there's a junction box, and then it spreads out to laterals that, you know, there may be four or five laterals connected to it. If you don't take care of your tank and you don't pump out those solids, eventually the tank's going to fill up. And what will happen then is it'll get into the other compartment and eventually could get into your drain field, start plugging up those pipes, um, and one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to come out of the ground and you're going to see a big wet spot out there or it's going to back up into your house. And, uh, you know, I have people tell me that, um, well, I use these additives and I haven't had to pump my uh, tank in 20 years. Um, just wait because uh, those additives, if you manage your tank properly and you keep it pumped and you do what you're supposed to, one, you don't need any additives. They don't provide any extra benefit. The bacteria from our bodies are what work in those tanks. Um, it's whenever you put things in the tank that don't belong, that kill the bacteria, or when you overflow them. Uh, if you have, you know, your um, if you have your softener backwash and you have a hot tub or those sorts of things um, going in there, or your sump, they shouldn't be. And uh, you want to run just a normal water through there that's, you know, your tank should be sized based on the number of people in the household, and that also dictates how often you need to uh, to pump it. And we do a webinar that's just about septic systems, and we did that in July, and that's recorded and on our website, so you can watch that video just like today's uh, webinar is being recorded and will be on our website by next week and on our YouTube channel. So um, it's worth watching if you have a septic system, and it provides a lot more detail than we're going to today. Um, yeah, so the things you need to do uh, as far as a to-do list, you know, maintain the area around your tank and drain field. Um, you shouldn't drive over it. You shouldn't plant trees over it. Um, those roots get into the, especially those perforated pipes. Um, you know, it needs to be open so that uh, it doesn't compact the soil. You, you know, driving trucks or tractors over the, the drain field eventually compacts that soil enough that it can't uh, really um, percolate the water as well. Uh, from the drain field. So um, you reduce the flow of water as much as you can. I'm not saying you have to conserve water, but again, you shouldn't have your softener backwash or sump pump or whirlpools going into that. Some states allow dry wells for your softener backwash, which is a separate uh, issue, but it uh, prevents that backwash from uh, going in and you know overflowing your tanks, so to speak, so that the bacteria don't have time then to break material down. Um, also, don't put things that don't belong in your tank. You know, if you have one of your kids is, is on amoxicillin, what is amoxicillin? It's, it kills bacteria. So it should never go uh, in your toilet and be flushed down in your tank, uh, into your septic tank. But also, um, if you have a garbage disposal, you know, those solids like from your carrots and, and uh, vegetables that end up in a garbage disposal and going into your septic, they're solid enough, if you will, and not processed enough already that bacteria aren't going to break those down. They end up in the bottom of your tank as a solid, and they, um, the rule of thumb is if you have a garbage disposal, 
if you're supposed to pump your tank every three to four years based on size of tank and number of people, you need to have that. So it would be every one and a half to two years because it'll fill it up that quickly. And, you know, the worst case thing that can happen is your septic backs up into your house. And, uh, you know, that happens a lot more than, um, that, than is talked about, if you will. So you should have your tank inspected. If you have no idea how many solids are in your tank or what level it's at, have a um, septic specialist come out. They have a device. Most of them have this thing. It's, I think it's a trade name, but it's called a sludge judge. It, it basically takes a core sample of the, the depth of your septic system. It'll tell you just how much solids you have. And when it's over a certain amount, 75%, I think, uh, is or something around there, um, is when you should um, have your tank pumped and cleaned out. So... Um, I want to talk a little bit about Septic Smart because, again, it is uh, Septic Smart Week. Uh, here's EPA's web page. This is a great page for resources, and uh, you could get lost in here. Not, I want to say lost like there's too much, but there's a very comprehensive set of tools, um, both for people with septic tanks and people who work with people uh, who have septic tanks. So um, what you need to do, uh, why, you, why you need to do it, all those things are here. Um, and it's really simple. It's epa.gov slash septic to get you to this page. And um, I'm just going to go through a few of them. If you go to the septic, septic Smart Homeowners page, you can see all these different pages here, how your septic tank works, um, why you need to maintain it. Um, there's an outreach toolkit if you're someone who's trying to reach out to homeowners with septic systems and a lot of technical resources, um, you know, information about why a septic system is a risk to your drinking water system. You can see this figure Here's the top half of that page. There's a diagram talking about setbacks and what happens. And you don't know the groundwater flow direction in your aquifer. It may not matter that your septic tank's actually 100 feet away like it's supposed to be. Um, if it's getting into the aquifer where your water is being withdrawn and the flow direction is towards your well, um, if your septic system isn't being maintained properly so that things coming out of the drain field are fairly broken down already, um, you could be creating a source of contamination. And a lot of times that's what we see. Or not understanding that if you're on a, a lot where you have a neighbor on both sides, maybe your well was installed so it's 100 feet away from your septic tank, but your neighbor's was as well, and that puts your neighbor's uh, septic system only 20 feet from your sept from your well, um, or your, yeah, septic tank to well. So there's a lot of issues like that that you need to be aware of. It's worth knowing where your neighbor's um, well and septic system are. And uh, again, if you have a shallow well, you can kind of follow the landscape to get an idea, uh, and I mean less than 50 feet, of the flow direction. But a deeper well, you know, the flow direction could be just opposite of the land surface uh, slope. So you could be, uh, the, the water on, on the surface could be flowing downhill to the left uh, in an aquifer that's at 200 feet deep. Um, the groundwater flow direction may be just the opposite and going, you know, what would be uphill for the land surface. So um, if you don't know those things, there's folks you can ask. You can talk to your state geological survey or in Illinois, your water survey. If it's a major aquifer, we'll have information on the flow direction, for instance, and so will your geological survey in your state or the USGS office. And it's worth calling those folks. They want to help you. Um, and even your local health department or extension may have that information. A uh, few more pages here, advanced technologies. These are becoming more and more popular, partly by necessity. Um, a typical wastewater uh, septic system may not treat the waste um, well enough to prevent uh, contamination from reaching a vulnerable aquifer that may be near the surface, or as I mentioned, karst, where there's not a lot of material to break down in the soil. So um, more and more you're seeing areas that are requiring um, advanced treatment really like a treatment you'd have at a wastewater treatment plant, but on a small scale. And a lot of those are aerobic systems, and there's a lot of information here that um, you can get to on those uh, types of sites. Um, and lastly, there's a, a webcast page, so that a lot of the webcasts that EPA has done over the years are all listed here, and you can watch any one of them um, based on, if you're looking for an innovative type of septic system, if you're in a vulnerable area like, you know, Sulphur County, New York, they have bedrock right at the surface, and so it's much more risky um, letting anything get into the ground there. Uh, so those sorts of issues. So as far as testing, um, you should test your well annually for coliform and bacteria, which I'll talk about in a second. But also anytime your well has been opened 
or that you notice anything different. Or if your neighbors are on uh, wells and somebody's gotten sick, then it's probably worth testing your well just to, to be sure. Um, what do you test for? Well, it really matters where you live. You know, I was asked to answer this question for um, the Association of Public Health Labs, and they wanted a straight list for the entire country. And really, there is no straight list because uh, there's certain things that everyone should test for, but there's also other things that may be contaminants in your area. And I'll I'll show you an example here in a second. But always ask your county or state health department. You know, I'm going to sample my well. Are there any naturally occurring contaminants like arsenic or uranium or anything in my area that might be a concern? Should I test for those things? And so, um, you know, also talk to your extension uh, person in your county, um, your neighbors. Find, you know, try to be inquisitive and learn if there's been anything that's happened in your area. Many times there won't be, and that's a good thing. But in some cases, like we have a couple aquifers here in Illinois where that's high in arsenic. And in those counties, the county health department knows that. And when a well owner contacts them, the first thing they tell them is, we'll make sure you sample for arsenic. So, um, and again, the reason you sample for coliform and nitrate annually is they indicate a pathway into your well. They're so ubiquitous at the surface. And um, if there's a source nearby, that if you have any kind of um, shallow source and you have a shallow well, or if your well isn't per properly protected at the surface so that things can get in near your well cap um, or the top of your well, they're going to show coliform or nitrate, uh, probably. Coliform and nitrate themselves may not harm you. Um, they're an indicator. Um, e. coli is actually the dangerous uh, type of bacteria. And if you have E. coli, um, you know, for one, if you sample for coliform and you have coliform, you should test for E. coli to make sure that it's not um, you know, from a source like livestock or from your septic system because that is dangerous and, and uh, a health risk. So, um, but it's a good way to ensure that you know your well uh, if it has never had coliform or, or nitrate problems um, and all of a sudden they show up, then you know you may have a breach in your well or some other thing that's going on. And it's a, a good way, it's fairly cheap uh, to just have that peace of mind that nothing's changed at the surface. And so here's a couple examples I mentioned. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection has this website. Um, they have a lot of arsenic and uranium in, in their state, and they've mapped all that. So they've tied this mapping tool to an address search, and you type in your address, and it'll plot your point, and it'll tell you if you're at risk of arsenic or uranium uh, contamination in your private well or bedrock well. Um, so assuming you have a bedrock well, and uh, it'll tell you whether or not you should probably test for that to be sure. Um, I show this example because um, that big splotch in the middle, uh, this is Rhode Island, and that big splotch, hopefully you can all see that, is a beryllium. And until I found this on their webpage a number of years ago, um, I had no idea even that beryllium was a regulated contaminant, but it is. Community water supplies are required by law through the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, to make sure that beryllium is under a certain uh, level, a maximum contaminant level, or MCL. And there are no MCLs for private wells, which is why um, in most experts and most practitioners working with well owners use the drinking water um, S, um, MCLs that are required for community water supplies as a surrogate to say this is what's probably safe and not safe. So um, if you're over an MCL, like for th these little dots that are all through the, the the state are where orchards used to be, and especially um, before the 60s or 70s or so, um, arsenic was one of the primary uh, pesticides that was used in orchards, and so most of these have pretty significant soil contamination, and depending on the depth to aquifer, um, some of that leaches down in and could be, an, uh, you could have an arsenic problem in those areas. But um, yeah, the reason I show this is because beryllium um, is a unique contaminant, um, it doesn't exist in a lot of places. It's the only place I've ever encountered it on a state map. And so unless you ask and you live in Rhode Island, you wouldn't even know that that's uh, something you should be concerned about. So, um, And the third one here is more and more states are starting to develop these tools. And this is Wisconsin's tool they've developed. Their state DNR, uh, Department of Natural Resources, is their primacy agency and also regulates well construction and, and drillers. These are private well samples they've collected. And this uh, GIS tool allows you to go up in the right corner and pick a contaminant. I picked arsenic, and I said by county. So the MCL for arsenic for community water supply 
um, is 10, 10 parts per billion or 10 micrograms per liter. So you can see um, there are three or four counties, especially on the uh, left side about in the middle that are clear. That means they have no samples, but all the others are either green or some other color. And you can see by the legend, um, anything that's uh, yellow, orange, or red means that the samples on average uh, that have been collected in that county are, um, are over 10. And so it's just something to be aware of. You know, if I was going to buy a home, uh, you know, I could look at this for arsenic or nitrate or a few other things, I believe. And um, you can determine even if the, you should be more concerned. You can search by township or, or go down to a smaller scale. But what I would prompt you to do if you looked at a map like this and you were in that area is to call your county health department first or DNR in, in Wisconsin and ask them for advice. Um, you know, they're there to help you. Um, they can't tell you you can't use your well, but at the same time, um, they may recommend you don't if you have a, a high value of one of those things. But it certainly helps you understand what you should test for. So here's what we recommend. Again, annually, coliformin nitrate. And then um, every three to five years, we think you should sample for this list. And basically, it gives you a good um, idea of groundwater chemistry. You know, your pH matters for corrosivity. So does... Um, alkalinity and a couple other things. You know, if you have an older home or you have galvanized pipes or lead pipes, then, you know, if you're in Illinois, our pH typically of our groundwater is seven and a half, and we don't have nearly as many corrosive water problems, but we still can have them based on chloride and alkalinity is my understanding. But in other areas like the Piedmont Aquifer in Virginia, the pH of that water is naturally 5.5 or less. And so if you're on, uh, you have lead pipes, or galvanized piping, which a lot of the piping material, like for the drop pipe for a well, is made out of galvanized, um, which has lead in it, uh, then you're more risk for having uh, a lead released in, in your drinking water. So um, these other things, some of these are even for aesthetics, um, you know, understand how much iron you have and fluoride, you know, that's also a health risk if it's too high. And there is natural occurring fluoride in places. And so basically, this is a list we provide. Um, and then as well say, this third bullet, Talk to your local or state health department. Let them know where you live. Is there natural occurring anything here? You know, again, if you're, I'll just use the example. If I'm in Rhode Island in an area where there's beryllium, then I know I need to find a lab that can also sample for beryllium. And you can go on the US EPA's website and look at, um, you can just type in beryllium toxicity. And um, you can find information about what kind of problems it causes, what the risks are, what levels are dangerous, what the MCL is, all those sorts of things. And again, um, the whole point here is we're trying to give you the tools so that you can go and find this information and just be aware and, uh, you know, develop your own knowledge about your well and your situation. So where do you get it analyzed? Um, every state accredits labs, which means that they've um, performed some sort of uh, testing under specific conditions and met the right criteria. You know, they've been giving, given samples that are of a known quantity and they're able to reproduce those. They follow all the right procedures. They use the right EPA methods for how they uh, do the analysis. And so, um, you know, there are labs like our lab, for instance, or West Virginia University's lab or Texas A&M's uh, extension lab that are not certified, um, that are reputable labs. But again, uh, in general, you know, my message for folks across the country is you should use a certified lab. And the EPA has a list of those. Um, we actually have a, a web page that we've set up on our um, privatewellclass.org. If you just do slash lead at the end, um, it'll take you to a page at the very bottom of that page. It takes you to the EPA's web page where they list all the accredited labs in each state, and uh, you can find labs that way. Um, or you can just search, or you can call your county health department again. Some county health departments actually have their own labs. Um, not many, but some, and but they'll know who um, can do sampling for you. Um, and when you talk to a lab, then uh, a good lab will give you detailed instructions, explain how to store or preserve if you need to, um, when the sample needs to be collected. You know, I just collected a sample for my son who just moved out to a, a farmhouse in the country, and it has an old dug well. And our county health department uh, said, you know, you, you need to bring it in the day you collect it. And it's got to be there before noon so they can take it to the lab in Springfield, and it could be tested within 48 hours. So, you know, they give you the right information and you should ask questions until you're satisfied and you understand. And if you run across a lab when you talk to someone and they can't tell you anything about what you should sample for, 
how to do it or if they've got the attitude that you need to tell me what you want to sample for, find another lab. Um, we're at a point in uh, the type of water quality issues we have in the country that labs need to have uh, knowledgeable people that can help you. And if they don't, I'd find another lab. It may cost a little more, um, but regardless, you want to make sure that your experience and what happens and the results you get are something that um, you know give you what you need. So, um, yeah. So, um, interpreting results, again, um, what I'll tell you is you should take them to your health department to get a qualified answer. Um, but there are websites out there that give you information, and you can do that first um, just to give yourself some peace of mind. But then, um, especially if they show that there's some issue, uh, then I would take it to a health department and get a qualified answer from a health professional. And also, um, sometimes it, it makes sense to resample just to confirm, especially if something really seems out of whack. Um, something shows up that isn't expected or... You, know, you have a, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense that this did, that it happened. Retest to make sure. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, if you have a bacteria hit, a coliform hit, then do an E. coli test and, and don't drink your water uh, until you can, or boil it until you can get your well chlorinated and you find out for sure what's going on. Okay, so um, this website is was developed by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, though it was developed for residents of New Hampshire, it's available to anyone. And it is a, a tool that you can use. It's called the Be Well Informed Guide. And it allows you, you can click on enter your water test results at the bottom uh, there, and it takes you to a page where you can enter your water quality results. Um, what's nice about this is no matter what units your lab gives you your results in, whether it's milligrams per liter or micrograms per liter, um, you can change it and put in the right value. So I put in 15 micrograms per liter of arsenic, which is over the MCL of 10. And so when I did that and submitted it, it told me that um, the value of arsenic's got the red X there. It's over the MCL, which is listed in the regulations as 0.01 milligrams per liter, which is the same as 10 micrograms per liter. And then uh, it even gives you information on types of treatment that will help with that. And, um, you know, you need to talk to a professional at that point if you're going to add treatment. One thing we do know, um, especially about RO systems for arsenic, arsenic exists in two, form, pl two forms, plus three and plus five. Um, RO works on one of those. It doesn't work on the other. And so if it turns out, um, and no one is going to speciate your arsenic for you and provide you whether it's arsenic three or arsenic five. Um, yeah, and I mean, you can get that done, but that's a separate test. So the point is it gives you some information. I would take this result then to your health department and ask them for more uh, for, for more guidance on what to do next if you have a high result. Um, it also explains the health issues and, you know, what the standards are. Uh, if you're going to add treatment, you want to make sure you add one that is for arsenic in this case. If it's a absorptive media, it needs to meet standard 53 for uh, NSF ANSI standard. Or if it's um, RO, it needs to meet ANSI standard 58. Um, treatment equipment, some of it does meet those standards, which means it's been tested to take out arsenic to a given level, and some that's cheaper may not. And so you want to make sure that it's got an NSF, um, a UL, or a, a gold seal from Water Quality Association, which means it's been tested and meets that standard. And it says, it, uh, you know, 58 or 53, depending on the, the, uh, what kind of a system it is. So. Um, as I mentioned before, these tools are really just a guide, and they're for typical waters. So there are very odd situations out there. Um, we ran across areas where the pH is 12 in groundwater, um, and there's a good reason for that, and it's in a specific area, um, but um, it's not a very typical groundwater. They've discovered bacteria that were previously unknown existing in those environments. They're so, um, yeah, they're so, uh, yeah, it's just so unique. So the thing to do is take it to a health professional. And again, that's usually a county or local health department and ask them for advice. And, um, and I say they cannot tell you to stop drinking your water or condemn your well. They can only recommend that you should add treatment or you should stop drinking it and tell you why those are a risk. Um, out east in a few uh, health districts, they may actually have that authority and that's changed uh, in the last few years. And so um, I would talk to your health uh, department first. I know like in Illinois, 
you know, our health department can say, you know, it's really not very smart to drink water with 150 PP, ppb of arsenic. Um, I would treat it. I wouldn't let your kids drink it. Um, but in the end, it's you as a well owner who's responsible to decide whether you want to drink that water or not. And we certainly run across people who say, my grandpa lived to be 86. He drank it his whole life. I've drank it my whole life. I'm not worried about it. And, you know, that's that's a personal choice at that point. Um, it's just it's not what we would recommend. Um, and lastly, about treatment, um, the big thing about treatment is usually it's done for a specific process, like RO for arsenic or uh, some other constituent, or the reason you're softening your water is because it's hard water. Um, the thing about whatever kind of treatment you have, even a filter, um, just because maybe you have you know some sand coming through uh, a screen or whatever, is you have to maintain it and replace it on the schedule that it gives you. Um, I actually had... Um, an engineer from the Minnesota Department of Health tell me that we probably shouldn't even, our class shouldn't even talk about treatment or recommend people add treatment because in his experience, he's seen more people who don't maintain their treatment equipment and in the end, it becomes the source of their contamination. Um, either a membrane has gotten fouled and now bacteria are growing on it or um, it's being completely bypassed because it's so clogged that, you know, it's got a basically an overflow type uh, piece to it so that um, it can bypass it when the filter's full so you still have water. Um, if you're going to add treatment, you got to be willing to take care of it. And, you know, that's also associated costs, especially if you're replacing the filter or a membrane um, and those sorts of things. And that's really what I'll say about, I mean, we could talk for hours about treatment or Dan could, I should say, and uh, that's, you know, that's not the point here today. So um, that's what I have for our presentation. We did get a lot of questions. And so we're going to spend uh, the rest of the time trying to answer those. So if you registered for the webinar and asked a question, um, we won't get to them all. I think there were probably about 90 questions this time. And uh, so um, obviously we can't uh, get through all of those in an hour and a half. Um, but uh, if you something I've said today triggers a question, um, again, use the question box or the chat box. And Katie's keeping track of those. And I see we already have at least one or two. Um, and we'll try to look at those at the end if you're willing to stick around and um, and that'll be you know kind of at the end of the official webinar if you will so um, where to sample and why uh, what I want to say about this is you know you get different results from different things so especially um, you know like the well I grew up on we had a softener um, in the so it was but it was in the house so the outside spigot close to the well had no kind of treatment but the water in our kitchen tap was softened. So um, what Dan's lab does is if someone, uh, he asks that question when they call and want to get a sample taken, you know, um, they ask them to collect both. One is for, you know, the reason that we want an outside spigot where there's no treatment is that's to benefit us as scientists. So we can look at what the quote groundwater quality is. If you let it run long enough and your pump is pumping, now the water's coming from the well and the groundwater and that's the natural water quality. So that would be an outside spigot sample where the water coming uh, from your kitchen tap is your drinking water um, where there's things that can happen in between. You may have a filter. You may have a softener. You may have RO. Um, you also may have lead or copper pipes. And depending on the type of water chemistry you have, when that sits overnight, it can change the chemistry of the water in those pipes. So we usually ask for two. Sometimes he'll provide three sets of bottles for folks so they can um, look at those differences. And I was... I'm going to show you an example of that here. So this is a well owner in Illinois near near Champaign, and these there's going to be three samples here. This first one is from an outside spigot. And so you can see all the constituents our lab tests for. Um, a lot of things, the, the right or the left arrows mean less than, um, but you can see sodium is 25.9. Um, over on the right side, the turbidity, turbidity is 29.8. Um, further down, um, the hardness is 351, and the pH there is 8.02. So this is an outside spigot. Um, if we go to the next sample, it's after a filter and a softener. So the softener does its job. Um, it's taken out the hardness, and now it's 0.68. If you look in the bottom right, um, it didn't really change the pH. It, it increased it just a hair, but the turbidity is gone. Um, but look what it did to the sodium. It went from 20-something up to 198. So if you happen to be on a low-sodium diet, you may not realize that your regular salt softener is increasing the amount of salt in your, in your drinking water. 
Uh, that's one consequence I want to bring up. Um, he also had a um, RO unit on his kitchen tap, and so when you add that, you could see an RO takes almost everything out. Um, it doesn't quite take everything out. Boron is still really high. Uh, there's a few things I think Dan could explain this better. But, um, you know, the significant thing to me is it lowered the pH to 6.23. And this is water that's at a pH of 8, which is, you know, well above neutral of 7. So when you have a lower pH, they become more acidic. That's when you have to be concerned about, um, you know, potentially creating more of an environment for aggressive water uh, to affect the solder. Uh, or pipes that you might have and cause some of those things to be released. Um, and most of the time, most people have a kitchen tap RO unit like this person does, but um, there are whole house RO units. And if you happen to have one of those, it could have implica more implications because now you've lowered the pH of your water and it's sitting in your pipes overnight um, before you're pulling it out uh, at your kitchen tap. And so it you know, I don't know if this is the case in every instance. We came across this at our lab, and uh, we haven't really studied it, but it, it, it all makes sense. You're taking all the buffering out of the water but when you run it through an RO unit, and you're basically taking everything out of it, and so the pH is going to go down. So that's why you need to be aware of what you're doing and uh, what the, the implications are and why you need to sample. Um, you know, the other reason to sample once you've added this kind of treatment is to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to. If this home had high arsenic and they were at an RO unit to take out the arsenic, you want to sample after that thing's running and make sure it's actually doing the job. And it could turn out that you added RO and it's, you know, the wrong form of arsenic that's in uh, the water, which isn't typical, but it happens, and it may not be doing what you think it's supposed to do. So um, well maintenance, um, what do I need to do yearly? So here I want to make a plug for our class. We have one of our lessons, which is between 6 and 10 pages long, just on these issues. So as you go through our class, the way it works, um, it sends you a lesson once a week, every week for 10 weeks. You sign up on our web page, and I'll talk about that at the end, how to do that. Um, but it's free, um, and you know, you're on your own to read through those. But we talk about best practices and maintenance and what, and maintenance and what you need to know. And, um, but what you really, you know, the short answer is you should inspect your well to make sure the well cap's in place. The vent tube has a gasket or has uh, a screen. If it has one, that the gasket's sealed. All your bolts are in place. Um, you know, I grew up using a riding mower. Um, it's really easy to see. We had some posts in our front yard that I ended up breaking off just by, you know, going in kind of road gear, if you will. Um, you need to make sure that if no one's hit your well, uh, no one's backed into it, crack the casing, those sorts of things um, are where uh, things start to go uh, south for your well as far as, um, you know, having things get in your well or uh, causing problems below surface. We see a lot of wells that get uh, hit at the surface and the cracks two feet below the surface and you never know it, but all of a sudden they have a bacteria problem that they can't explain, and it's because there's a pathway into their well right near the surface. So, um, yeah. Um, those those are the simple things you can do, as well as test um, annually, and uh, really it's, you know, make sure you're not storing things near the well, uh, those sorts of things. So um, one other question that we get all the time is about disinfecting your well or adding chlorine. Um, there's a lot of bad advice out there as far as, um, you know, I had a well owner tell me in northern Illinois last year, well, you know, my contractor told me just to pour a cup of bleach down my well every month, it'd be fine. That does nothing to disinfect or prevent things in your well. All it does is that straight chlorine, um, if you have a pitless and it's got rubber seals, is that chlorine acts on those rubber seals to wear them out a lot quicker. And you're going to need to have your pitless replaced in, you know, 7 to 10 years instead of 20 to 25 years. So um, the first thing is you should only disinfect your well whenever you've sampled and you have bacteria. There's no reason to do it on a regular schedule. It doesn't do anything uh, to, and as an advantage, if you don't have a bacteria problem and you don't use straight chlorine bleach, um, you know, which is like 5%, you need to mix it to a concentration uh, that's appropriate so that it won't harm. Um, the other thing that straight bleach at that high concentration can do is um, it's an oxidant. So if you have a bedrock well and you have me uh, metals in your bedrock aquifer itself, um, that uh, high amount of chlorine uh, will oxidize some of those metals and release them, and they'll show up. So lead, um, you know, arsenic, all those things 
uh, can all of a sudden show up as a slug uh, that might be in your drinking water um, because you've, you know, you've caused a situation that's changed the chemistry down in the well. Um, in our class resources, which I'll show at the very end, um, we have a web page that just lists maybe 8 to 12 resources for each lesson, and this is one of them for under Lesson 10, and so you can click on this and download it. It's a free document from the Minnesota Department of Health, and I'm just going to show quickly, um, you know, it's got a diagram depending on the size of your well. Um, you mix it up. Uh, it tells you how to do all those things. Um, you know, it walks you through a process. This is uh, probably eight to ten pages long, but it's got pictures and diagrams, and it even talks about, you know, your treatment units and what to do, where to find information from the Water Quality Association about uh, specific recommendations by the manufacturers of these different types of equipment to make sure that you're following the right steps when you chlorinate your well and that you don't affect any treatment equipment you might have. So, uh, yeah, um, we looked at probably going back, um, we looked at probably 60 or 70 different uh, sets of instructions for how to disinfect your well, and this is the one we feel is the most complete, is the easiest to understand, and provides all the right advice. And so we certainly recommend you use it. We were just at the State Fair in Illinois a couple weeks ago, and a well owner talked about needing to disinfect their well. I said, go on our website, download this, and he's a contractor was going to come out, and he contractor even said he wasn't sure how to do it. I said, print this out and hand it to him and tell him to follow these instructions. That's your best bet um, to get this done correctly. Okay, so as far as this, so someone asked, um, would you recommend connecting to a city water supply over having a private well? Well, um, after all the things that have been said today, uh, being a private well owner is certainly a responsibility, that you need to be up for maintaining and being a good steward and all those things. Um, we run into a lot of well owners where they really have uh, not put in that kind of time to understand their well. They really don't have the wherewithal to understand how their well works or what the risks are, and they aren't doing the things they need to to make sure that uh, they're being safe and protecting their family. So in many cases, we would recommend that if you have the option to connect to city water, it's much safer. Um, it's managed by a licensed water operator, and that's his job, to make sure that you have water, that you have sufficient pressure, and that the water is safe. So they do all that work, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, and you pay $40 or $50 a month. You know, um, our well was shallow and our pump was on the surface. If we were out of power in the winter, our pipes could freeze. So we kept a gas propane tank down there in our little well house, and it might be 2 in the morning, and we realize that the power's out. Somebody's got to walk down about 150 yards to where our well is, go in that building and try to light that, and make sure that that little building stays warm enough that our pipes don't freeze. And several times uh, where we haven't made sure that the tank still has propane in it, um, it's ran out of propane in the middle of the night, and then we have frozen pipes that bust, and it's really a mess to fix, especially in the winter. You know, there's just a lot of situations where if you have somebody else making sure that your water's safe, it's a much better situation. Um, we just had a colleague uh, who works here at the U of I who bought a house a couple miles south of Champaign. Um, it's an area where we know the shallow groundwater, uh, the shallow aquifer, which is about 80 feet below land surface, has arsenic in it. So we encouraged them to test before they bought their house, and sure enough, it did, 78 parts per billion. And it turned out there was a new subdivision going in right across the street that was going to be hooked to city water. So they contacted the city to see if they could hook into that. They spent several thousand dollars to hook onto city water, and now they don't have to worry about having treatment equipment, making sure the treatment equipment's working properly, and all the things you need to do. Uh, they're a young couple who plan to have a family, and it's a much better situation for them uh, just to know that their water is always going to be safe. So it's really a personal decision but it's something not to take lightly or say, oh, I can manage this. You really need to put some diligence into it, um, or in the end, you may be affecting your health or somebody in your family's health. Um, I recently purchased a house with a well, and there's no information about the well. How can I find out more? So nearly every state requires a well log be filed, um, but the rules are certainly different. Illinois started requiring that in 1968. New York, it wasn't until 2000. So, you know, we have 500,000 well logs, and that's probably about half of the wells actually in use in Illinois. New York has about 150,000 well logs, and that's probably about 15% of all the well logs in the state, or wells in the state that are in use. So, um, we actually, Lesson 7 of our class talks about how to find local resources. And so, the example I know in our lesson is type in um, Missouri well logs, and it brings you up to Missouri um, uh, DNR, or Department of Health. 
and uh, it shows you where you can get to a well log. In Illinois, our State Geological Survey provides logs online, they're public information, and they've developed this mapping application that you can go in and zoom into your area, and if there's a log for your house, it'll show up, and you can click on it and see the geology, and you can download the log, and like I said, even though Illinois started in 1968, we know from uh, working with a lot of uh, well owners in different parts of the of the state that we maybe have 50% of the logs that are actually in use today. So um, you need to find out from your state agency if you have those uh, things, what might be available. Some provided online, uh, like Illinois does. Some you have to request it. I know in California, only the well owner could get their log from their county, and they had to apply for that. They've recently changed that and made it more open. Um, I know. Um, Right in the height of the drought in California, we had several well owners who contacted us, and I said, I need to see your log, and we went through this long process for them to go get their log from their county before they could send it to me, and, um, you know, they should be accessible. So, quickly, um, this is the State Geological Survey's page, and over on the right, it says Illinois Water Wells, uh, Illwater, which is a poor name, but uh, it stands for Illinois Water, and the, the box here on the left side says Illwater Interactive Map. When you click on that, it brings up a page. I've zoomed in to Champaign County, which the the darker color there is the Muhammad Aquifer, and it's showing the major aquifers, which I've clicked on on the legend on the map layers, and those blue dots are all wells. The other colored dots are different types of wells, bridge borings, um, you know, other kinds of borings uh, that are have been done in the geo survey keeps track of. But as I zoom in, um, right in the bottom center, it says U of I, University of Illinois Willard Airport, you can see these wells, some of them show zero depth because we don't have any record. We know there's a well, but we don't know the well depth. There may be a chemistry log for it, um, some other thing. But the well I clicked on says, um, you know, it's got a record, tells you who, who drilled it, um, if we know that information. And then when you click on that API number, it creates this, inter this is created from a database. This isn't the actual log. But you can see that you can look at the geology. Um, you can look at the information about, you know, so their, their well, um, it says the casing goes to 142, and then there's six feet of 1.25 diameter 12-slot screen. So that says this is a sand and gravel well. It's in that compact, fine sand and gravel. And so that's, you know, you know where your water's coming from. Water can't get into the well um, until 142 feet below land surface, which is a good thing. And they've actually pumped it to see what kind of drawdown there'd be. And on this particular uh, log, there's also a link to the water survey's actual scan of their log. And so if I click on that get file, um, it shows me the actual log. And this is what was submitted by the driller back in 1968 and the information that's available there. Sometimes there's additional notes or other things that might not be on that constructed log. But you can certainly see uh, this had a concrete pit that was five feet deep and 50 inches in diameter, which again, um, we certainly don't recommend. And, and uh, that well actually didn't have that now, but it did when it was first installed. So it depends on what state you're in again, um, but you may be able to get to all that kind of information. Um, and we can help you with that. And let me go back. Um, if, if you're really having trouble finding anything, uh, contact us. You know, one of my staff um, can certainly take a look and see if maybe we might uh, be able to come up with something. We can also get you in touch with the RCAP person in your state. Um, who can contact you and see what they can find. They're actually more versed with the other states because they work there and uh, may be able to provide you some information. So a couple groundwater questions I wanted to talk about. How deep do wells need to be and how long does it take surface water to get into a well? You know, those are both really open-ended questions is the bottom line. It really depends on the geology, um, the depth to the aquifer where your well is uh, coming from and, and those sorts of things. So for instance, if I have a 200-foot sand and gravel well uh, that has a screen in the bottom five feet, like the example we just looked at, or six feet, that means the water is only coming in the screen uh, from 195 to 200 feet. The rest of the casing is solid. Water can't get in the well anywhere but down at the very bottom. But I could have a 200-foot bedrock well um, in a different area where there might only be 30 feet of casing. And you hit bedrock at 20 feet, you go 10 more feet and you seat the casing in the, in the bedrock so you're sure it's solid, and the rest of that hole is an open hole. When you drill a bedrock well, most of the time you're trying to take advantage of the fractures 
that are in the bedrock, that's where the water is coming in. And so you leave the hole open so that water can come in from those fractures. It's almost like an intricate piping system. But what that also means is that water can get in your well from 30 feet on down. So if any of those fractures end up at the surface somewhere else, now you have surface water that can get into that uh, vulnerable aquifer, basically, um, and maybe have a conduit directly to your well. So you need to understand the geology um, and the location you're in. And again, your state geological survey or USGS office, those folks um, are more than willing to try to help you. You give them your location. Um, if there's information or mapping's been done, um, you know, they can help you with that stuff. So, um, and these questions, uh, when I see these, um, the, the big thing is take our class. If you sign up for our class and it walks you through well types, um, basic geology issues, um, why bedrock wells are different than sand and gravel wells, and um, it's, a, it's a good way to get a good uh, core knowledge of, of what you need to do as a well owner. And then when you talk to your state geological survey, you'll be able to ask a lot better questions than, than just, you know, not understanding what those differences are. You'll have an idea of what that is. So um, you really, you know, one of the main things you can do is, is go through our class. It's, again, it's self-paced. It's free. Um, it's a way to, um, to understand uh, some of the basic issues you might have depending on your location and the type of well you have. Um, but you need to know your local geology, and the best way to do that is from your well log like the one we just looked at, you know it's clay and then sand and gravel. There's no bedrock in that log at all because we haven't hit bedrock yet because we're glaciated here in northern Illinois. And um, so there's two or 300 feet of glacial material before you hit bedrock. And that's not the case everywhere in the country. All right, so Dan, I got some questions for you. Um, yeah, we often get a question. It's really common, probably one of our most common questions about how to get rid of the rotten egg smell. Uh, occurs in a lot of different wells. Um, I, I will admit I'm not an expert on the uh, biological um, functions. I'm more of a chemist, but uh, I think usually the, these types of smells are due to biological activity, like in this case a sulfur reducing bacteria. Um, so a lot of times the, the answer is to try to get rid of that bacteria. Uh, chlorination, um, if you do chlorinate your well, uh, if you disinfect your well, and that takes care of it, that'd be the best thing if, you, if it were a one-time growth. Uh, and sometimes um, it's not, sometimes it'll, it'll keep coming in. Like if it's not uh, in your plumbing or the area around your well itself, it's just, if it's gonna be in the aquifer, I think you may need to go with continuous treatment. Uh, but uh, sometimes people have told me that you uh, can chlorinate and maybe, maybe you have to do it a few different times uh, because the, bacteria will grow in layers or in crevices, uh, things like that. Um, but the hope would be eventually you could kill it. And um, yeah, uh, the chlorine will also uh, oxidize the, uh, the hydrogen sulfide to sulfur and probably have a filter afterwards to, to remove that. Uh, so what I think people can do is uh, try chlorination first and see if that helps. It's pretty easy to do. And Steve had instructions uh, earlier from Minnesota that were really good. Um, okay, so the same thing that happens a lot in hot water heaters, and so and it's a sulfur smell. Yeah, so. I think it's the same kind of thing. Uh, a lot of times they'll talk about the de deterioration of this anode rod, and uh, you'll see different uh, treatment techniques. Some people will say disinfect it with chlorine or peroxide. Some people will say turn up the temperature to try to kill off bacteria, but then if you do that, make sure you turn it back down so you don't leave it scalding. Um, I always like to tell people, you know, consult with a plumber or somebody in your area who's dealt with the specific problems, and they've they've dealt with real world experiences. Um, I have seen references to powered anode rods. Uh, in the old days, people used to say, "Oh, just take out that anode rod," but that's really not a good idea because it serves a purpose. Uh, it it's a sacrificial anode, and so it'll corrode before your tank uh, corrodes. Now, a lot of tanks are a lot of hot water tanks are. A glass line, but it doesn't mean there aren't uh, either micro cracks or, or junctions that could corrode. So um, just be aware of that. And I, I guess I added a, a sentence in here about softeners. Sometimes people will think a softener, sometimes people don't know what softener does, but they generally remove hardness, which is calcium magnesium. Um, and they won't, they'll remove some other things, but uh, not uh, typically the smell. 
Yeah, we've even seen that they can remove uh, arsenic once in a while, but not necessarily, they're not designed to. Y yeah, yeah. So what's recommended equipment for removing coliform and nitrates in E. coli? Uh, yeah, so th that kind of question also comes up. Um, the, f the best answer is try to get rid of it from the source, like if you were to chlorinate. Um, a lot of times people will ask, you know, what will reverse osmosis do? Uh, I think it will get rid of those. I don't think it's intended to get rid of the, uh, to be used as a primary treatment device for bacteria because uh, while they may be larger than the pores, uh, they can also grow on it. And, and Steve mentioned earlier that you do have to take care of your treatment equipment, so you don't want it to be a breeding ground and make it make things worse. Um, nitrate should be easily removable with reverse osmosis. I know there are a lot of these, that's a pretty common, it's pretty easy to install a uh, point of use unit. You also see references to um, distillation systems. I, I don't really see those too often, but those should do basically the same thing. Um, uh, probably a little bit more effective in, on some things. Um, a lot of times you'll, some, some people will ask, hey, can I just boil my water? And that'll work for uh, coliform bacteria, uh, or, or generally you'll hear about boil orders that will kill off biological things, but it'll actually concentrate nitrate and many other arsenic and other minerals that are present. So you don't want to use that if, if, if you have a problem with nitrate. Okay. Um, okay. There were a number of questions about RO, and so um, this kind of summarizes that, I think. But um, so, you know, several people asked. Um, I know one was about whole house treatment and stuff, but, um, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Oh, yeah, there's there's a lot of questions about RO. It, it, uh, nice, nice placement of this because we just finished talking about RO. But uh, reverse osmosis is pretty common. It'll uh, remove about 90% of, of minerals, and, and you think other things too. Um, but some of the things we listed here, like pesticides and some organics and dissolved gases, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's unpredictable. I, I, I would suspect that a lot of times it has problems with those. Um, but a lot of times those things are uh, there at the maybe parts per billion level or lower. Uh, so your primary stuff is still going to be removed. You're still going to see like 90% removal of, of sodium, calcium, sulfates, uh, things like that. Um, so, some of these trace element things, uh, I don't think you're going to see them guaranteeing that they remove those. Um, I would just check with your manufacturer. The uh, uh, NSS, NSF also has a website that has drinking, uh, certified drinking water devices that I usually like to go to there and, and uh, you can look up brands and, and things and look up treatment types and see, get a little more details about what these things will take out. Okay. Oh, and, and the, last, the last point here, I guess uh, Steve mentioned earlier that there are uh, reverse osmosis units that are for the whole house. Uh, you know, that's pretty unusual, I think, for a, for a household to have that. They, they do produce a lot of water. They can produce a lot of water, but they also produce a lot of wastewater. So all, all our systems will waste, uh, you know, depending on settings, it, probably about 75% of the water you put into them. So you'll have that uh, to deal with too. Yeah, and that seems like uh, for a whole house system, that's a significant amount of water. Yeah, I, I would think so. And so, I mean, I mean, I think it would, to put it in a whole house RO system, you'd have to have a specific reason where, um, you know, either something was so contaminated that you couldn't shower in it and that sort of thing. Um, otherwise, you know, what's much more common is that under the sink for your drinking and cooking um, yeah. water, just because that, of that reason. The whole house, it would, you'd also uh, probably run into other difficulties. Steve mentioned some of that earlier. Um, also, it'd be similar to like, Soft water can be take a lot longer to wash um, soap off things. Oh, yeah. So you know if you if you showered in river, I've I've not really thought about it before because I I haven't really talked about this from a whole house standpoint. Although I've talked to a couple people who have pursued it, but uh, you you would probably not like it in some of the aspects. Um, okay, so this is one of the last questions I think. Um, do you have contacts to recommend in Southeast, South Dakota, Minnesota, or Iowa that could check my well and give me information? So I, I included this because it's a chance to, again, bring up RCAP. Um, all three of those states are part of uh, the RCAP region uh, that's called MAP, the Midwest Assistance uh, Program. And, um, you know, 
they don't sample wells, but we do have a program where um, RCAP folks go out and work one-on-one -on -one with a well owner to do an assessment. It's a vulnerability assessment. They look at the geology. They try to find your log. Um, they look at the, the regional geology and then look at the site and ask you a bunch of questions like, do you have lead pipes or copper pipes and all those sorts of things? What kind of treatment do you have? When's the last time you sampled? Um, it's a nine-page form, so it takes a little time. Um, we developed it with a, a group of private well experts from around the country for RCAP to use uh, nationally. They've done about 1,500 of those assessments already in probably all 50 states or at least the 48 states. Um, and um, if you're interested in having an assessment done, you can contact us and let us know where you live. And I will forward it to or we will forward it to the appropriate person, um, the private well lead for MAP. Um, is Jesse Campbell, which I've mentioned here, and um, I'd be glad to forward you his information. Um, so it's just, you know, again, this program from EPA is, is meant to be education and technical assistance, and so um, our role is to provide, like, workshops and um, these webinars and our class that's online, and then um, RCAP's role is they've got staff and experts uh, in all uh, and throughout the country who um, can meet with you, answer your questions, um, let you know about uh, in-person workshops that are being put on. Um, and I should also mention that there are, um, we work with five states uh, through their extension programs, and they also um, can help you. Um, Mississippi, at Miss Mississippi State, Texas A&M in Texas, uh, Rhode Island, um, at Rhode Island, University of Rhode Island, Virginia Tech in Virginia and Penn State uh, in Pennsylvania. And they're all extension staff. They have a private well program. Um, some they do sampling, um, some that's more workshops just to help you become a better well owner. And uh, like in Texas, it's called the Texas Well Owner Network. They have a really nice well owner manual. Uh, we actually use some of their figures in our class lessons for the private well class. And so, you know, um, we've tried to build a network of folks that can help you locally because clearly, um, you know, uh, here at the University of Illinois, we can't run uh, to all 50 states. And uh, so, you know, it does. It takes a team, and we've got quite a team that we've built. So um, if you're interested in those things, um, again, you can email us at info at privatewellclass.org, and uh, we can get you in contact with the right folks. Okay? So... Um, so for the last few minutes here, I want to talk about the private well class. Again, it's a series of 10 lessons. You sign up on uh, our website, and with your email address, it only asks you for your first name and your email address and what state you live in. And that's really so that we can um, provide EPA with uh, evidence that we are reaching all 50 states, and we are. We've had over 6,000 people take it um, from 50 states and from about 13 countries. And so... Um, this webinar is really just a small piece of that, and they provide specific information and, again, allow us to answer those questions. So if you go to privatewellclass.org, um, somehow I skipped a slide here. Uh, yeah, here's the front page, and you click on, and I've got these out of order somehow. Um, on the bottom left, learn by email. It takes you back to this page where you sign up, and you just click on class instruction emails every seven days. It'll send you one lesson. It's a PDF. You can open it up on your browser. And uh, or on your computer and or, or on your tablet, and you can go through it. It's uh, again, it's all self-paced. There is a pretest we ask you to take. You don't have to. There's a post-test and there's an evaluation. Um, what I can tell you is um, over 99% of the people have taken it have given us a really positive evaluation about the material that's there and what they've learned from it. And um, you know, it's just meant to be information. Then you've got that uh, to support you down the road as you um, uh, have issues come up with your well and uh, it gives you advice and, and some of those sorts of things. So um, I also mentioned that for each lesson, there's a resource library. And so here for lesson one called the Science of Groundwater, um, on our resource library page, you can see um, these different, uh, all available free and publicly available from different sources that are all about uh, groundwater flow and some of those things. And so if what's in the lesson didn't quite do it for you, you can go to one of these other uh, resources, and uh, it's probably one of the more popular things is folks who really want to learn more about their well end up looking at uh, more of these in more detail. So 
Um, and again, you can go through that as well um, at your own pace. Um, it's all there. And it's always available. Um, so like the webinar we're doing right now, it's being recorded. And um, by next week, Katie will put it up on our website. Um, the one we did last month was about lead. And so um, you can go on our website or on our YouTube channel and you can watch that. Um, we brought in an expert from Virginia Tech who's a lead and private well expert to talk ab ab about the work she's done and also the things that we've learned. And uh, just it's a, it's a good uh, background on what you need to be aware of and what you need to look for, um, especially a lot of private well owners are on older homes. And so, um, you know, those tend to have more lead uh, in their pipes, either from solder or lead, uh, leaded pipes themselves. And um, we also have a short, uh, if you go under webinars and events, and uh, well, if you go to our training videos page, um, we've got 16 uh, videos along with the webinars. And there are simple things like, how does my, why does my well keep losing pressure? How does my pressure tank work? Um, you know, what is a bedrock well versus what is a sand and gravel well? And, um, you know, it walks through, it's four to six minutes long. It just kind of gives you a good overview uh, of that piece uh, of your system, so to speak. And it's interesting, um, our, our video on how does my pressure tank work has had nearly 200,000 hits in two years. And that's taught us that, or told us, that there's not a lot of information online about it, and everyone's coming to our site, and also that a lot of people have pressure problems, which I think is pretty common. <coughs> Boy, excuse me. So in the end, what our goal is, again, this is a technical assistance training and education program, is to help you understand as a well owner why your well is important, why you need to understand it, and how it works, and what the issues might be, so that you can protect yourself from risk and your family from risk. Simple things like sampling every year, um, knowing uh, the type of geology you have and the type of well you have and how deep your water is coming from, all are things that you should know. And you should have a copy of your well log so that you understand what it's like. Um, and you should have resources available to you, like you should know a person at your county health department or your state health department, maybe at your state geological survey or resource agency like DNR, and also your extension person. They can all um, help you and give you advice on different things or find resources for you if you're having trouble finding them yourself. And you can always contact us as well. So um, it's really about being aware. I said, I've said most of this already, but you need to understand where your well is versus what your pump setting is. And, um, you know, we have people who run out of water and it turns out they've got a 200 foot well, but their, their pump is only set at 60 feet and there's still actually 125 feet of water in the well. And it just, it's lowering that pump by 40 feet and all of a sudden they have no problem anymore. Um, but hopefully it teaches you to, um, enough about your well that you're asking better questions um, and the right questions to make sure that everything's working well uh, with your well. And again, uh, the bottom line is you need to sample to be sure you're safe. You know, a community water supply has to sample every three months at a minimum um, for a number of constituents. And over time, if they show that they don't have some of those constituents in their, in their water, they, then the, uh, the state agency that uh, regulates that will let them back off. You know, like it doesn't make sense for our groundwater supply to sample for algal blooms um, or those toxins or, you know, vice versa. But um, you need to sample as well. You know, wells deteriorate. They don't last forever. Um, you know, things can change. We saw it here in Illinois when there was a minor earthquake down in uh, Missouri. Uh, some of our wells in southern Illinois, uh, the water levels changed by three or four feet. Um, that's not a dramatic thing in itself, but um, unless we test, we don't know if that actually changed the water chemistry too. Or two different aquifers that weren't connected now connected that have different chemistry. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that you would never expect that could happen, and it's just worth sampling your well. So um, with that, that's what I have for today. So what I'm going to do now is uh, pull over the questions that we have um, for our, um, that you've asked today. Uh, pull this up here for today. Um, okay, so I'm going to just read this and then we'll go through it. So extend the pipe up for all prior 1960 wells. A homeowner is having a tough time understanding how this protects from contamination. Preventing flooding makes sense to them, but not a protection from contamination. Any, quote, good arguments, um, they have, quote, sealed it, 
and capped it, but it haven't extended above ground. Well, if it's still in a pit, um, no matter how well of a seal you have, you know, it's usually five bolts and there's a gasket. Um, depending uh, over time, uh, and if it's got an, a vent, uh, a tube on it, um, if every single connection isn't completely watertight, anytime it floods or anything gets in there, you're going to have water that can seep in the well somewhere. So when we say it's not all wells prior to 1960, it's just some wells were installed that way in pits, and pits are a dangerous thing. So it's um, so by filling that pit in with clay, and if, as long as you're sure that uh, where you've connected the extended pipe to the existing well pipe is sealed, um, maybe caulked, or you know however that's done, uh, they decide to do that um, so that it's watertight then um, water isn't going to get down in that pit and eventually seep into the well. And um, I get they've capped it, but again, a well cap in many cases isn't actually airtight or watertight. And so really that's the best argument I have. Um, I mean, there's if it's a really shallow well in the end, like you're in a sandy area, um, we have areas in Illinois where people drive sand points, which, you know, aren't very protective. But even uh, shallow sand and gravel wells that are in sandy areas, um, the bottom line is they're a vulnerable aquifer. We see higher nitrates, we see ag chemicals, because they're going to seep into the ground. Sand's a you know good conduit, and and there's not a lot of resistance where in a cl more clay topsoil it's going to run off instead of running down. So there's certainly reasons uh, why you could still be contaminated in a particular aquifer, but it, again it's a case by case basis and um, you know, it, it, it prevents that flooding water from overtopping your well. Um, you know, a best practice, and, and I think any health department will tell you this, if your well has been flooded, no matter how sure you are that it was sealed, uh, the best thing to do is to sample it and make sure and not drink it until you have, because a lot of times you're going to find that it actually was contaminated. Um, it just, well caps uh, don't stand the test of time, typically, um, for being watertight. Again, like I said, the gaskets get brittle. Um, maybe uh, the bolts were all put on. It's not, you know, it's it's not snug on there like it should be, or it's got a vent tube, um, or even the tube for the electrical wire, which is that little second, you know, that one really nice one I showed was a white PVC casing with a green top. That second small pipe was really was the wiring um, line, but it, even that, you know, ends up having an opening down the well where the pitless is uh, going down to the pump. So. Um, yeah. Uh, so what's an annulus? Uh, well, I tried to explain it. I didn't do a very good job. Um, but basically, it's the area between the borehole, which is the hole you drill in the ground to put in a well, and the outside of the well casing itself. So typically, you know, to get a well in, uh, if you want to put in a 5-inch diameter well, you may drill a hole that's 7 inches diameter so that the casing will fit into that well. And that way, if you know, at some depth, if some of the geology is soft enough where it starts to squeeze, you still can get the well, that five-inch well in there. But, um, so you've got an inch all the way around your well that's open because you've got a seven-inch hole and a five-inch casing. And you fill that annulus with grout, which is either cement, uh, clay, or a combination. And every state, or most states, have rules on what kind of grout you can use, how much grout you have to have in the annulus, and again, that's so that you haven't created a pathway from the surface down to wherever your well screen is or where your casing ends for surface water to get down in your well. Um, so um, it's a short circuit if it's not done properly. And the annulus, again, is just that void space between, yeah, you know, it's the outside of your casing to the uh, outside of the uh, borehole that you drilled, which is just an open hole. You know, like if I was using a postal digger, and I have an 8-inch auger on it, and I drilled an 8-inch hole all the way down, and I put a 5-inch a round uh, post in, I have to fill that rest of that in with dirt to make it solid. Well, you're filling that in with clay and, and concrete to make sure that water can't run down along the outside of it, outside of the casing. Um, is it possible to get an up-to-code manual well, meaning manual like doing by hand, um, pump added to a well cap in case of power outages? You know, um, I don't know specifically. Um, I do. I, I don't know if they're actually the code 
I do know there's um, a company or two that have started making those. And the idea is just that. Um, it's part of your well cap, so it can be sealed. And you don't have to open your well. Um, and it has a, you know, maybe it's a one-inch line that goes all the way down into your water. So that if you have a power outage, <coughs> boy, excuse me, um, you can still get enough water out, you know, to flush a toilet or something like that. Um, you'd have to ask your state um, if there's if there's a code for that in the first place. Um, your state agency that you know regulates well construction. Some states probably wouldn't allow that, um, but I do believe some do or don't have a code for that. So it's possible. Um, because I do know there's a company uh, that makes those. And, um, yeah, and whether a good idea or not, you know, um, we went through a power outage when I was, uh, I was in 1976, so I was, I was probably 12 years old. Um, and we had an ice storm. We didn't have power for seven days. And it was cold enough that, you know, um, we had a generator, but uh, we were really limited on the amount of water we had. And so, um, you know, something like that in the right situation, I mean, it wouldn't have worked for our well, um, but if you're in a really remote area, um, you know, I don't know, I, that's probably a personal decision. And as far as uh, whether they're up to code or not, you have to check with your state. Okay. Um, so my well is not on an Illinois well map, and I thought our house was built in the 70s, which means it should be if the well was also installed there. Um, my neighbor's well is not on there either. Any idea this might be? Well, um, so when that law passed, um, as you can imagine, drillers weren't used to doing it. It wasn't um, necessarily every county was in charge of enforcing it their own way. And when you have 102 counties, you probably have uh, some folks at the county health department at the time who uh, had the wherewithal and the staff to actually enforce that from day one, and you have other counties who maybe didn't have the staff. Um, you also have cases where drillers felt like that was unnecessary and it cost their customers more money. Um, I've certainly in my career here, uh, which started in 1986, um, I've ran across um, drillers who didn't necessarily file all the logs they should have. A lot of times that happens in subdivisions where uh, they'll go in and they build all these homes. None of them are sold yet. They'll put in a well at every house. They're almost identical wells, same depth, same type of construction, same everything. And they maybe turn in one out of every three or four logs, which you know, doesn't make sense to me because it's clear who did it. Um, but uh, there's a number of reasons why that would be. Um, and that's, you know, they should be there if the wells were installed in the 70s. But again, it wasn't... Uh, well enforced and there wasn't a real robust program back then and um, so we see a lot of especially in the first 10 to 15 years of that program uh, that wells necessarily weren't all uh, submitted and uh, you know to be honest I ran across an area where uh, a couple well owners told me that who drilled their well and they were drilled in the last 10 years and they are filed and so um, yeah uh, it, it is what it is in that case. Um, hopefully there's some logs near you, um, or um, if you have information about the well log, um, here's what I can tell you about this that uh, everyone should know if you're going to build a house or put in a new well. Make sure it's a part of your contract with your well driller that you get a copy of the log. Now in Illinois, that's not a problem typically, um, but I've ran into folks in other states who are like, well, my driller is very protective of the well log. They didn't want to give it to me. Tell them you're not going to let them drill the well then. Um, you know, they either give you the log, a complete log that explains everything and has all the information on it, or find somebody else. Uh, that's not priv privileged information. It's not private information. You paid for it. Um, you make sure you get it. And if you have any idea who might have drilled your well, um, you can call us. And uh, because the state water survey houses all the well logs um, for the state, we might be able to figure out uh, who it is. Um, but one thing I can tell you is in 2010, I did a study where I sent out uh, five grad students who spent a summer mapping every well in nine townships. They found 1,706 wells, 1,708 wells, and we only had logs uh, for 788 of them. Um, we asked the folks at each home um, 
who their well driller was, and we got 54 different answers. Now, some of these people have lived there for 40 years, um, and the bottom line is um, currently in that area, there are only four well drillers. And so um, you have issues like you have a company that, you know, the, let's say the Smith Drilling Company may have had three drill rigs and um, three different well drillers, none whose name is Smith. So if the well owner told us the actual name of the driller instead of the name of the company, then we may not have a record of it. Um, you know, there's all those sorts of issues. Um, the other thing that can happen, not to belabor this, but most well logs are filed by legal description, township range, section 10 acre plot. Sometimes those are reported incorrectly. Um, I've certainly ran across more than my share of well logs where we've had to move them over a, a section or sometimes even a township where someone slipped a number. And so um, it could be any of those things is the bottom line, unfortunately. So, um, but if you'll email us and give me your information, we can talk about that more. Since you're in Illinois, um, you know, we can certainly do a little investigation and see if we might be able to come up with something. So, okay. Uh, sorry to spend so much time on that. Um, I found a uh, 2017 CCR. So Consumer Confidence Report um, is not a private well thing. Um, it's something that's required by law by a community water supply to give to their customers every year. So if you found a CCR um, that isn't talking about wells, it's talking about um, the homes they sample as part of the lead and copper rule. And um, so the, the lead and copper rule for a community water supply says that you have to test a certain number of homes in your community that are on your water supply um, every three months or so, whatever it is. I think it's every three months. And 90%, the 90th percentile sample has to be low 15 ppb. So it's not a public health standard because 10% of those wells can be over 15. And the CDC has come out and said that, especially for children, there's no safe level of lead in a water supply. So what the lead and copper rule does is give a community information about their lead problems so that they can change their treatment to either add um, things that make the water less corrosive, you know, like phosphates to make it, uh, to raise the pH and those sorts of things. Um, and if they had 50%, that's, that's, that means half of the wells they tested as part of that program um, had lead at higher than 15, where if 10% would have, they would have been considered safe as a community. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense, but, you know, especially in Illinois, um, all of our plumbing practices are based on uh, the laws that have been put forward through our plumbing code in the state, which until the 80s said you use, use lead pipes, which is why Illinois has more lead pipes than almost any state in the country. Um, yeah, so I don't know who Scott Green is, um, at least out of context I don't. Maybe I do know him. Um, but if you could send me that information, um, we can look into it. We can talk more. Uh, but yeah, CCR is not a um, private well thing, unless you're talking about something else that I'm not aware of. Um, have I heard any feedback on a Berkeley filter system? I've never heard of a filter system, and I know um, because of our position uh, working for the U of I in the state of Illinois, um, we really wouldn't recommend one over another uh, regardless, and I, I don't know what that is. And uh, Dan, do you have any idea what a Berkey filter system um, is? I've talked to some customers who say, hey, I've got a Berkey water system or they'll list Berkey filter system. Uh, I don't remember specifics. And just like Steve said, I, I don't know that I would put any opinions forth anyway um, because we don't really take sides on, on different brands of filters. Okay. Well, um, that's all we have today. Um, I don't think there's uh, – let me throw this up here. Um, I appreciate everyone who stayed. And if you have any additional questions, there's our email address. You can certainly contact us. Um, and uh, Katie monitors that. And especially for the NEHOF uh, forms, um, make sure you download those if you are a sanitarian, a licensed sanitarian. Um, if anything comes up, you can always email us. 
um, I think an email will go out uh, when the webinar has been um, edited and placed on our YouTube page and on our uh, videos page. And so um, with that, um, thank you for attending. And um, yeah, look, you can look on our webinars page to see uh, what webinars we have coming up. I know we're not doing one next month um, because we are uh, partnering with the National Environmental Health Association on a virtual conference they're putting on for um, sanitarians and other professionals. So I think the next one we have will be in November. So um, thank you and uh, sign up for our class and everyone have a great day.